Welcome to the Tricord Advisors podcast, where we answer life's hard questions to help you make smart decisions with your money. I'm Jeremiah Lee, and this is Randy Barkley. We're both certified financial planners. I'm also a California licensed attorney. Today, we're going to talk about something kind of near and dear to our hearts, but it is. It, it, it's it's finances. We're, you know, we're going to talk about, it's a larger series we're going to do right now that's going to be all about financial planning, investment management, kind of the whole piece of what we do. And we're going to chop it up piece by piece, have a number of episodes. But we're starting with how, how do we get here? Like, well, why do we even have this industry where people use brokers and, and wealth managers and, and a piece? I mean, there's other pieces, but the main piece I see where this started was back in 1978. You know, if that was, you know, back, back then, they started what was called the 401k. We have that now. Most people have 401ks. But before that, it was just pensions. You worked for a company for 20 years, 30 years. You got the gold watch, you know, kind of the stereotypical stuff you think about of the 50s and 40s. Everybody was looking for retirement and they knew they were going to get social security and pensions. Yep. So if you worked for the company, you got promotions in the company, you were going to get your social security, you were going to get your pension. And that was was it. That was everything. That was all you needed. 1978, they changed the rules a little bit and Congress came out with this thing called a 401k. That's referenced to the tax code that they put it. But people use that as a basically a private savings device that you as an individual or a company could set up for you, but you were able to set aside some of your salary, some of your income into a tax deferred account. And then in your retirement, you could use that. And I, and I don't know if it came out initially as a supplement or as a replacement. Um, what, well, I, what I, was, I was around at that point in time, and there was a lot of argument about the benefit of a pension. And the argument was, is that if you have your own additional savings account, you could put money into this 401k. And, so, and some private companies had a pension as well as a 401k. There was a matching aspect of it. There was all these factors. But bottom line is the companies were transferring the burden to the employee. Mm. And they were saying, as an employee, you're going to do better because you could contribute from, from zero up to a certain percentage. And some companies said, we'll match that. Yeah. But there's a lot of variation. But at the crux of it, at the very base of it, companies were transferring that responsibility to the employee. Yeah. And that, in my mind, gave rise yep. to, in essence, a whole industry that people, you know, say they did that, they put started putting into their 401k, and then they got close to retirement and said, what am I going to do with this thing? I now have this money. It's my life savings. And they have the, on one side, the freedom, on the other side, the responsibility right. to manage it. Okay. And so- they worked with financial planners and with brokers. And um, it used to be years ago, you couldn't buy a stock. You couldn't buy a mutual fund on your own easily. You had to go through a broker. You had to go through. And there was fees fact, associated. Fact, just before the advent of the 401k, that's when the financial planning industry kind of had it had its, had its beginning. Mm. And so there was the College of Financial Planning. There was several different associations and such as that. And it's confusing for most people because through this period of time, the industry has got what I call the alphabet soup. We've got all these different designations yeah. of people that from a broker to an insurance agent to a financial planner. I mean, we got all these different variations of people who say, I do the same thing. But in actuality, we know it's not the same thing. Right. They don't do the same thing. And they, they have very different approaches of why they're doing it. So Often, you know, today you have brokers, and a broker is is here to, in essence, facilitate your purchase or trade of a of a fund or a mutual fund it's or transaction a stock. based, right? It's transaction based, and they get a commission based on what you do. So they'll sometimes present some clever ideas. Hey, based on what you're doing here, you should be into this fund, and you say yes, and they say perfect. They put some money in there, and they trigger a commission for themselves. And that was initially a lot of I, I think how it was running. People were help, helping and planning and being brokers. Well, as you move forward, the, the, the costs of trading um, in the last decade or so have come down dramatically right. um, all the way to zero to where now to buy or sell a, a stock, you don't have an $8 trade fee or a $12 trade fee. It, it's zero. You just make the trade. And with that, up came these what we call robo-advisors. And there was a big concern in the industry of financial planning you know, between the you know, 90s, 2000s, you know, kind of till today of saying, well, with it, with with fees coming down, robo advisors coming up. This artificial intelligence, right? Yeah, yeah. We don't even need these advi- investment advisors. We don't need any of these folks. People can manage their own investments, and these robo advisors will tell them what to pick. Um, and there's a concern in the industry, and we've not seen the, the the concern was that, or the 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 thought was that all these financial advisors, their fees would come down, 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 down to almost oblivion, and it would be a, um, a, a, a kind of a throwaway job, something that wasn't right. really needed. Right. Uh, but we've seen the opposite. We've seen fees either normalize or even go up. But the, the big change is the services provided. It's no longer that you just walk in and say, 
hey, I, I need Google. Could somebody please help me buy it? Because you can buy it on your phone. You can, yeah, you, know. you could you could open an account almost instantly and buy yeah. whatever stock you wanted to buy, yeah. right? And if someone said, hey, I don't just want to buy one stock. I want to get a whole basket of stocks. Fidelity, Vanguard, there's a, any of these companies, they have these little robo-advisors where you can do it. But where the value that, that we provide, where, where people are, are desperate still for this assistance is when they say, okay, I put in all of my information. It says I'm fine. Can I quit my job tomorrow? Um, <laughs> did I put it in right? Am I, did I think about social security? You know, I, I, you know, all the different factors that go into someone's life um, to make these holistic decisions. And that's where the industry has moved from just being facilitating a trade to maybe helping you build a portfolio, but now saying, well, of course we build portfolios. Uh, of course we do budgeting, retirement planning, tax planning, estate planning. Like we do all these things where we look at someone's whole life. And it, it's been this, this, I think a dramatic arc from, from, you know, everyone just used to get a pension and relied on the company. So now they get that freedom, but also responsibility. And so many people now say, well, what do I do with this? And that, and that's really a key point there because the individual employee, the what we call the participant that could put money into a 401k, uh, they were given this absolute freedom. And what we have seen is a lot of people have failed uh, to make the contributions that they needed to make yeah. because they had no objective of how much money they needed. And what happened is that most people, particularly the rank and file, people that were wage earners, uh, they were spending their money. They were paying their bills. They were they were they were taking care of their family. They were paying their mortgage and all yeah. such. And what we found is that people did not set aside money, or if they did set aside money, they put it into a holding. They really didn't track. They didn't know what 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 they were supposed to do with this. Yeah. And so it's created this kind of obscurity. And employers have had this hands off. Okay, it's not yeah. my responsibility. It's your responsibility, Mister Employee. Yeah. Right. Well, a lot of people probably have that experience that they have a four hundred and one k. They say, right. "Great, I want to get in it. What should I invest? I got twenty funds." And the employer, the HR folks, have to say, "We can't give you financial advice." Okay, you know, yeah. <laughs> and you're on your own. I mean, right. legally, that's that's where they're at. They have to you know make their own choices. And we see a number of folks who have good jobs, good um, earning abilities, but they either are not putting in enough or they're conservative. Right. They just, they think, hey, this looks safe and they put the money there. And then 20 years later, they realize I could have been so much more had I been aggressive right. when I was in my thirties. Right. That was a good time. And so, so you know, that's kind of the, the history lesson a little bit of where you get to. But now in today, like, I want to talk a little bit, like, what are people's alternatives? How do you manage their money? And, you know, I, I think, you know, we're wealth managers. That's what we do. So we have a bias, of course, but there are other ways that people manage their stuff. And we'll talk through, you know, some yeah, of those. Let's do that. Um, a, a first one I, I think is uh, getting a broker. Right. You know, people say, I got a stock guy or I got a stock gal that, that will help me buy this stuff. And I see that um, uh, lessening. I, I see more and more people that are, that are not just excited to say, well, I, my broker only calls me. We had one recently that said he would call his broker and say, hey, I was thinking about this. And the broker says, oh, that's a great idea. We should do it. And the the, 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 the person we're so, talking to. Why do you have it? Yeah, why have you? Right? Yeah, was saying like, why am I coming up with all the ideas? I'm not the ideas ideas guy. You should be the ideas guy. Right. Um, and some of these brokers are, are managing a lot of different things and they're trying to watch funds. And the other, the other thing too is that most brokers are tied to a broker dealer and broker dealers then have, priorities maybe, I guess is the best way to say it. I want to be careful here, but they have products or companies that they're kind of putting at the forefront. Yeah. And the brokers have a tendency to sell those particular, kind of push those things, I yeah. guess the best way All to say those that. personalities that thrive there are, are in a sales type capacity. Right. Yeah. right. Um, so some people get brokers. I see people that, you know, because of Robinhood or a number of other apps, they can do the trading on their own. And my peers, a lot of them say, well, I don't want to buy just Google. I, I get that that is risky. I want to buy a basket of funds, either through a mutual fund or an exchange traded fund, an ETF, and I want to spread out my my risk. Right. Um, so then you have people that are moving to more robo advisors. You know, they'll go on, onto Fidelity's website. So, so a robo advisor, are are you interfacing with a person at all? Then no, it, it's technology okay. that you you'll go in there and um, I've done it myself just to understand how these things work. You go through and you say, um, you know, I'm this age. This is my income. This is what I want to be in the future, and it. it pushes out, this is what you should invest in. Right. And then says, would you like to do it? Sure. And then it sets up a portfolio for you. So you answer a series of questions yep. and they kind of build a profile of you, of where you're at and what you're trying to accomplish. But the thing that I, I would say that a robo-advisor doesn't know is doesn't know all the different various 
uh, aspects of your life that could happen from that point going yep. forward, right? And how honest people are and how holistic they are even putting the information in. Right. I mean, I, I think I compare it a little bit, you know, me, my background being an attorney is like LegalZoom. You know, I, I'm never scared that LegalZoom is going to put me out of business because I've read LegalZoom documents, you know? And if if I, as an attorney, went through the LegalZoom process to set up, say, an estate plan, I'd probably get an estate, a great estate plan out of it because I know how to answer a lot of these questions and know what I'm looking for. Someone who doesn't, you know, they're just clicking. I've had a number of, you know, trusts that were completely out of left field. And it's like, well, where'd you get this? Well, I went through something. And it, LegalZoom can be great. Their documents, I'm sure, are phenomenal at times. But it's it's the user interface, the ability to know what you don't know right. and to get in there. And I think right. it, a lot of these robo-advisors, I'd, I'd say it's probably in the same ballpark. The ability to know what you don't know, that when you click this button, you think it just says, oh, yeah, what's what's my risk? But really, you're you're dictating the entire future based on that choice you just made, and not understand the impact of that. Yeah, I just I just met with a prospective client. He's uh, he has a four hundred one. He's a he's a participant in a larger four hundred one k plan. And his comment to me was, he says, I put my money into what I thought was a conservative holding based upon the sub accounts, the choices they had. He said, but it's down over fifteen percent uh, through last year. He said, what happened? I said, well. I, I kind of dug in and I showed him. Mm-hmm. I showed him what the content of that particular holding is. He goes, "How come they didn't do that? How come they didn't meet my request?" I said, "Because it's not their responsibility. You yeah. pick. They buy. Yep. They expect you to know what you're buying and for you to come back, like right. to say, okay, it's been three years from now, and my my future's changed. Now I want to retire at this age, or you know that that lead specifically, or that pro- prospective client was." You know, theirs was well. When the economy changed, why didn't they change the investments? And all these robo advisor type things, it, it's setting you up for a you know ten year perspective without any sort of course corrections along the way, unless you as the you know are right. proactive doing that. Right. So then I think people move into the next. Uh, let me take a break. Um, We're going to take a break right now. We're going to continue this conversation, and Jeremiah and I are going to kind of un, you know, kind of just uncover, so to speak, the whole aspects of of financial planning. 